Hey there, it's Manny. Thanks for tuning into the Faithcast, the podcast that's all about building your faith one episode at a time. I am so grateful to have you here with me today and hope you're ready to dive deep into the spiritual journey together. Whether you're a longtime listener or just tuning in for the first time, I want you to know that you're part of our faith community. We're here to support you every step of the way. So let's get started and see where our faith takes us today. Hi. I wanted to follow up with a bonus uh, podcast episode this week because I feel like I didn't get to talk as much as I wanted to about the Holy Spirit. And to me, it's something that's so precious to talk about and worth all the time. We could do weeks and and weeks of discussion about personal experience with the Holy Spirit, uh, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, um, some of the results of being in communion with the Holy Spirit and all in between. Um, And I guess really what I wanted to hone in on, because I talked biblically a lot last time, and I talked about the evidence and uh, the results and the process a little bit. I could go deeper into the process, but I really want to drive the point home. I want to beat this horse till it's dead and gone. I, I want to just go all the way the distance, home run this thing into the park, simply to say, As a Christian, it is so important to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's so important to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit that when you talk about having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, people get offended, people get bothered and uncomfortable. Um, And I just want to kind of say here, isn't it ironic that when you talk about the third figure of the Godhead, that people who are Christians who believe in God, believe the God that says he's three in one, Um, that he is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that when we um, talk about that God and we talk about the Holy Spirit, we don't believe that aspect. It bothers us. It makes us uncomfortable. And we just can't, you know, like, oh, what do you mean? I have to uh, feel things. I have to uh, have encounters and experiences. And I'm a Christian anyway, and I'm saved, and I know it, and I'm sealed. And that's awesome. But why does it bother you? Why does it offend you? If 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 the idea that being filled with the Spirit, not sealed, but filled with the Spirit, offends you, I'm left questioning why. The only thing, the only entity being that would be so upset that uh, a person is filled with the Holy Spirit or talking about the Holy Spirit filling people, the only person who would be upset about that is, is Satan, right? Because God, God is not going to be bothered by that. We can see in the Bible when Jesus cast out demons— the Pharisees were like, oh, he does it in the, in the name of Beelzebub. He does it in the name of the enemy, the, the name of the devil. Like God and, and people who believe in God weren't like, oh, how dare he do that? It was religious people who were so offended that anything supernatural was occurring that they weren't aware of. And I just want to caution people, if you're not sure about where you lie on this, make sure you're not like talking about this or or getting into conversations about this from a position of, like religious privilege or religious superiority. Don't be someone who's like, listen, I've been a Christian for 20 years, 15 years, whatever the case may be. I've studied the Bible academically, theologically. And and so I can attest that the Holy Spirit is this way or that way. Um, because almost every person in the Bible who believed they understood God was proven wrong at one point or, or surprised. I mean, even the apostle Peter at one point was just parked by God when he basically give him a vision of eating animals uh, that were not clean to teach him that the Gentiles could receive repentance. And not only repentance, but they could receive uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, rather. And so I want to bring that point home because there's so many people who, you know, you bring it up, and as Christians who do believe in it, sometimes we're, like, cautious to bring it up. I'm not. I'll talk to anybody about it. Um, But... I wasn't always that way. It was very uncomfortable at times because I don't know how they're going to react. Are they going to say I'm some like heretic, some lunatic, somebody who's crazy? And it's such a shame that like I can't talk about the wonderful things that God has done in my life through me and other people around me uh, by virtue of the Holy Spirit working through them. Right? These people were faithful men and women of God who submitted themselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit, lived their lives based on the Holy Spirit's leading. And were a blessing to me and my life and my family's life. 
You know, we've received words of encouragement, prophetic words, healing, other miracles, financial provision, all because the Holy Spirit worked in people's lives. And for some people to dismiss that very quickly because they have some academic philosophical understanding of God's character or nature um, because they read the Bible as a history book and not as a living letter written by God who's still active today, then, you know, you got to be careful. You're dismissing a whole group of people's experience. And the reality is you're dismissing it because you haven't had it or don't believe it can happen. You're not dismissing it because it can't happen. You don't have evidence it can't happen. Biblically speaking, there's more evidence that the Holy Spirit works today than that it doesn't work today. Biblically speaking, there's more evidence that believers should be having signs follow them. Not me, not maybe not all the time. Maybe we're not going to heal every single person. I mean, Jesus didn't heal every single person. Uh, Jesus didn't bless every single person, but these signs followed. When the gospel was preached, um, demons, you know, would be casted out of people. When Jesus would heal people and demons would be casted out and miracles followed, but not everybody. We know that, but there was enough that happened. There was evidence and it pierced people to their heart. Some people need the miracle to happen to them. Some people need to witness the miracle. Some people need to hear about the miracle. There are different levels of faith, but regardless, it's all the same. God is working through people by his spirit and these miracles and these signs and these powers, these activities are moving. And so, um, but it's not about the powers. I talked about this last last episode. It's about Jesus. Everything that happens, the healings, they happen in the name of Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit only reveals and only gives what the Father has allowed the Son to give. They work in, in, a, in, in coordination. It's all God, but the Holy Spirit brings what the Father has given to the Son, and the Son has said, go, because everything belongs to Jesus. So the Holy Spirit's moving the whole thing, right? Jesus said, um, I, I forgive you, and the Pharisees were offended. So he said, what's easier, to forgive this person or to say, get up and walk, this paralyzed man? It's easier to say, I forgive you, to show you that I have the power to forgive. I'm going to do the thing that's harder, get up and walk. And he gets up and walk. What was the point? It was to, one, show evidence that Jesus is the Christ, and two, uh, to glorify the Son, right? Because only Jesus could do that. Only Jesus could just... We don't tell people, get up and walk. We say, according to the Bible, and Peter is the first one to do something like this, what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. Jesus never said, in my name. He just said, get up and walk. He's the only one with authority. So when we do a sign or a wonder, when we work in coordination, in collaboration, when we submit to the Holy Spirit and say, what do you want to do? We do it in the name of Jesus. And when we do it in the name of Jesus, well, he is glorified. People see evidence to believe that this person is trustworthy and that what they're doing is supernatural. Therefore, God must be with them, which then leads that person into repentance. Their heart is convicted. Why would this God heal me when I don't deserve it? Why does this God supply or speak to me? He knows about me. Why? That person is then cut to their heart and repents. Someone might say, well, I don't need all that to repent. Maybe you don't. But the thing is, not everyone knows about God until they know about God. And unfortunately, not every person is going to know about God because they've read a book and come to a logical conclusion that what it says is real. Especially if it's a supernatural God who made the universe in seven days. This isn't like a math problem where we can prove that two plus two equals four. This is supernatural being that existed before time. It doesn't have a beginning or an end made something out of nothing, that something continues to exist, and then while he's everywhere at all times, at all places, doing all things, and in every moment he's present with all knowledge, he intervenes or works in the midst of everything, and he's constantly there at all times, and he knows everything. And then the whole debate of predestination, salvation, whether or not you can lose it if you're an elect, right? All that. If you think about all that, it doesn't make sense logically. So you can't, like, we have to step back and recognize there comes to a point where it's a matter of faith, believing that God is, believing in the invisible world, the spiritual world that the spiritual being exists in. And, and really the spiritual world is more real than the physical world because if God is a spirit, 
He existed before the physical world. So the, the, so the so it's the foundation because God made the physical world out of nothing. So what was first is the foundation, the spirit world. So that's more real than our world. Yet we don't live that way. We live that way. We we live like this world is more real than the spiritual world, and we dismiss spiritual things. But the spiritual world is more real because that's where God inhabits. That's where God lives, or rather. He is the entire spirit world because nothing can contain him. And that's a whole another conversation. But for the sake of just really talking this out and, and and building this idea, if God is spirit, he lives in the spiritual world and we live in the physical world. And then his spirit lives in us. And then we have communion with him while we're here physically. But one day we will live in the spiritual with him when we're in transfigured body and everything's made new and perfect. The Holy Spirit come and rusts on Jesus. Holy Spirit is how Mary gave birth. The Holy Spirit is how the waters parted and how the divine activity took place. You know, it says that Paul says that in the in in, in the spiritual places, right? There's principalities and powers and uh, and activities. And Daniel talks about how the Prince of Persia was battling the angel. There's things happening in the spirit, and yet we live like two thousand years later, and we don't want to believe it or talk about it and dismiss it. But but we want to say the Bible's credible. But then we want to live like if what the Bible said isn't applicable today. We, we With sin, we don't do that, right? We're so adamant. No, if the Old Testament said it's a sin, you know, we should still live. You know, when, when when liberal Christians, when very liberal, open-minded Christians come out and say, uh, no, you know, the Bible spoke at a certain time and things have changed, right? If you get like conservative Christians or Christians who take the Bible at what it says, they'll be quick to say, um, this is what the Bible says, and so we live by it. Okay, well, the Bible says in the book of Daniel that the angel was in a battle with the prince of of uh, Greece, with the prince of with the prince of Greece, and so that's talking about a, a spiritual power that was opposed to God. So there was a spiritual battle, a literal spiritual battle that took place that stopped the delivery of a message from God, and that the archangel Michael had to help come so that Gabriel can come deliver the message. That's like that's a real thing. Daniel's prophecy about Jesus and the future hinges on that experience. And then we say it's real and trustworthy, but we don't believe that what he said about the spiritual battle is trustworthy. Because if that happened, then that means that they could be battling today. It means that like there could be princes of nations battling in the high places for control of influence, control of, of kingdoms, right? Because why would there be a prince of Greece or a, um, not a prince of Greece? I apologize. It's a prince of of Persia. So that prince of that time, why would there be a prince if it was to control uh, that territory? What was it doing? How could it be a prince? A prince is authority. So this prince of Persia had authority over that kingdom. That kingdom then uh, is under its influence. So whatever that prince does, it kind of emulates. Everything starts after the king and it models down. We're from a different kingdom. So we submit to the king of heaven and what he does in us models down. Why is that happening? Well, clearly because the spirit world is more real and has more influence than we think. And that was back then. Is it applicable today? I say all of that, and I'm saying it very fast because I'm getting kind of passionate. Yes, it is applicable today. If, if, If the Bible is trustworthy and we're trusting what Moses said, we're trusting that the bush wasn't burnt, that the cloud rested on the, on the mountain and it was hard to get to approach. So, so we, we accept that all is true. Then the other problem is, that, that the people who don't believe in these supernatural experiences, they have to face the question, um, if we get rid of that, okay, it's true. So then we have to deal with wrestle with the issue. Well, was that for that time period? Well, where in the Bible does it specify that these things had to end? Like, are, a few responses might be, well, you know, the age of the apostles. Another response might be, um, it was evidence at that time because they needed that and we don't need it anymore. So as far as the age of apostles, nowhere biblically does it say that only apostles did signs and wonders. We actually have plenty of testimony in the Bible that multiple people did signs and wonders who were not apostles. And also when they describe the gifts, they never mention only apostles. Right? It just says these signs follow believers. So believers still are here and people are still believing. The other issue that we wrestle with is well, it's for that time because those people needed evidence. Why don't people need evidence today? I actually would flip the question. I think people need more evidence today. Back then, it was common to believe in God. Back then, it was common to believe in deities, and people looked at whatever deity had power. Today, we don't believe in anything because science has explained everything. 
um, Frederick Nietzsche said, you know, God is dead and we have killed him. And, and he, the, the purpose of that statement is to say, with the advent of science and the nuclear bomb, morals have gone out the window and there's no need for morality because we rely on science to answer every question. What science can't do is answer moral questions. Science can only inform us of information. What will happen when two plus two is added together? Can't tell us what that means ethically or morally for a group of people or for um, relationships, right? That a banker is going to see two plus two equals four differently than a chemist. Two plus two in chemistry could save someone's life with medicine. Two plus two in banking could mean that uh, we have a, a, a depression and the banks collapse and everybody's bankrupt, right? So science and math and, and, and logic can't answer these questions. So we've depended on that information so much. We explain that how, why it rains. We explain gravity. We explain the rotation of the sun. And we got all this data, the internet. And we're all communicating. We're all sharing that information. I would say that we need more uh, reliance on the spirit than ever before because the evidence to believe in God is is, is so few. The, this idea that um, the, the Bible stands on its own. The Bible stands, stands on its own. But the Bible for many, many years has been attacked and and refuted, not well, but by plenty of people who try to find contradictions or controversies within it. And so people won't even read it. But what you can't refute, or at least not well, is when your family member or someone you know was in a coma and then they arise out of that coma at the command of someone who says, in the name of Jesus, rise. You may not have an explanation, but you do know full well, hmm, this is this is something I need to investigate. And I, there's no refutation. I don't have to accept it as fully God, but I have to dig deeper. But with scriptures, people do all the time. You, you can go on any social media platform. There's a video of somebody twisting or misusing scripture to hurt people, to say that God isn't real. And there's so many different sects in, you know, sections, sex, sections of people who say, I believe in this or I believe in that. And, and, and they just twist things and use it for whatever purposes. Not always bad, but the point is, like, they believe this whole conversation. People use the scripture to say that, you know, the Holy Spirit isn't active today or God isn't moving supernaturally on the earth anymore. And why? Well, because that's what they believe. And we can look at the same set of verses or evidence and call away with two different conclusions. What we both cannot do is look at a supernatural experience and walk away with different conclusions we will say, whoa, we don't know how this happened, but it did happen. So what's the answer here? And then, then we can go do digging and research. But even then, you know, people might try to explain it away. People might say, oh, well, you know, I can't explain it. So it probably wasn't God, but there's an explanation. But when it's the Holy Spirit and by its submission, God is very precise for the purpose of showing that person that God is involved to get to their heart. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody receive a word that's so precise and accurate and right to the heart of the problem. And that person just falls down on their knees crying and saying, how did you know? It was as if there was a fly in the wall and heard everything I said last night. And the only person I spoke to was my husband or my wife. How did you know? Well, the spirit's always present and God is trying to let that person know I'm here. That's a beautiful word of encouragement that will let that person know, trust God. I am here for you. I, I am your Lord. I have your back. I died on the cross to save you, and I have so much more for you. Live for me. You can trust me when I say do this. Um, You know, this is a personal opinion, but generally speaking, when I go to churches, there's a lack of service and volunteerism. There's a lack of people willing to serve, whether it's in ushering or praying or helping out in any, you know, task, you know, running services or mentorship or whatever the case may be. Huge lack. Everybody's too busy. And I attribute that to a lack of relationship with the Holy Spirit. It, if you are in a relationship with the Holy Spirit, which is God, you're you're always thinking about God, and you're putting him first. It's like having a best friend. You're always like, how can I call him? Let me see what's going on. Oh, what's going on with you? How can I help you? What can I do for you? Like You're always spending time together. So you're not like, hey, I'm too busy for you. I, I don't have no time. You, you don't have a best friend, and you're too busy to never see them. You're just not best friends then. If you have a best friend, you're calling them. Even if you don't see them, like, hey, is everything good? Do you need me? No. There's always, like, some type of interaction. You look at these churches and, like, you got, like, three leadership. They're not getting paid anything. Nobody's tithing in that church. 
They're working on the tightest budget. Like, why does the church have the smallest budgets? That's like a total side note. Like, why are there a ton of churches that, like, a bunch of people go to, and there's, like, never any money for them to do anything in that church? Like, they can't upgrade chairs. They can't upgrade, upgrade like, a, you know, they can't do a paint job. They can't get new mics. They can't afford, like, to, any type of materials for that church to do something with a little bit of excellence. You know, and the churches are always struggling. They're taking collections to replace an air conditioner. It's like, why? I go into Kmart. Oh, Kmart doesn't exist. I always use that example. Kmart. Oh man, I'm old. <laughs> Kmart. You go into like Sears, you go into Target, you go into these you know, Starbucks, right? They always got new tables, they always got new things, right? And nobody's ever complaining about paying eight dollars for a cup of coffee or twenty bucks for a t shirt. But you go to church and like nobody ever wants to buy the church, nobody ever wants to volunteer at the church. It's again, I attribute that to there's no spiritual connection. And I know that's a bold claim and gonna make somebody mad. Well, I love God. Do you really love God? If you're more comfortable spending more money at Target than you do at your own church, I'm not talking about necessities. I get it. You got to pay a mortgage. I have a mortgage. I pay my mortgage every month. I don't spend my mortgage at my church, but I don't spend more. I don't spend more money on coffee or movies than I do at my church. Like, wh- like, why would I spend four hundred dollars um, a month on coffee, but I can't give my church two hundred dollars to? you know, pay for like the electric or something like that. And so, and then you, you just don't love, you just don't love God that much. And, and I know that's a bold claim because it's, how can I not love God? Cause I don't give to my church. Your church is your reflection of your relationship with God. Like if you love God, you'll love the church that he puts you in. You'll, he'll, you'll love the community he put you in, the pastor that he gave you. Right. Especially like if you're in the church that you were saved at. Right. Like if this is a church where you converted and you grew up like this is where you became a mature Christian, like you, like you should be ashamed of yourself if you look at your church and 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 you're OK with your church. Like looking and it, like 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 it's in shambles, right? Like it needs a paint job. And and then you, like your house is like brand new and upgraded and, and has like five bedrooms and your church like has not had an air conditioner for two years. Like you should be ashamed of yourself. Because you love this earth and you love the material things more than you love your church. And and again, bold claim. And but I'm okay with making it because I know the lifestyle that God has called us to live as, and I'm and I'm doing my best to live that. I start with myself first. Like I would I I would be a bad Christian if I let my church fall in shambles while I continue to build myself an empire on this earth in cars and clothes and things. Because my job on this earth is not to make my life comfortable. My job is to make it that people reach Jesus, that his kingdom is spread, and they hear about how good his love and mercy is and how much we need it because if we don't have it, we're going to hell. That's my mission on this earth, not to have uh, a Tesla. I want a Tesla. It'd be very cool to have a nice new Tesla, but that's not my mission on this earth. If God permits me through my service to have things, then that's great. But I will not live my life prioritizing things before him. But you can only live that way if you're full of the Holy Spirit. You can only prioritize God and what he wants if you're full of the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean full like you already have him in you. I mean like daily being filled. I can't tell you how many times when I first became a Christian, I would tell myself I had the Holy Spirit, but I wouldn't pray for a couple of days. I wouldn't read the Bible a couple of days. I might skip a church service. And next thing you know, that week, I'm like falling into some just nonsense. I'm like looking at a certain picture I shouldn't be looking at, clicking on a side I shouldn't be clicking at, falling back into like wanting to drink alcohol, hanging out with some people I shouldn't be hanging out with. I start cursing. I start backsliding in my behavior. Why? Because I wasn't being filled. So if my eyes aren't on him, my eyes are going somewhere else. Because the reality is, and this is why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, how, regardless of how you feel, we live on this earth and we are spirit beings and we are flesh beings. We are physical beings in a body living in a world who's under the domain of Satan, which means he has access and control to the physical world and all of its temptations, all of its nice things. And so the enemy is going to constantly tempt you and the flesh does not want to gratify God. The scripture is clear. Paul says that this flesh will not submit. It doesn't want to please God. You have to bring it to submission. It doesn't want to pray. The spirit is always willing. 
So you live in your spirit. If you're not filled in your spirit, you will be led by your flesh. And if you wait long enough, you'll fall into a trap. You end up falling and sinning and, and, and participating in behaviors you know you shouldn't have. You'll be going back to those sins that you love so much because you've let your house be empty. You've let your house uh, not be filled, let the temple not be filled with his spirit. And so it's so easy for it to be filled with other pleasures. And it starts small. I mean, you don't, you don't read, you don't pray. And as you know, you're up at 11 o'clock at night watching the video. And you're like, oh, how'd that happen? Or you're listening to like a rap song. And it starts going a little hard and has a couple curse words in it. And you're like, man, you never listen to that if you are worshiping and praying. But, you know, Drake or somebody's going on. It started from the bottom and you're feeling it and you're feeling yourself and your flesh is being, you know, your ego is being stroked. And you're like, yeah, I work hard. And you're getting a big head. You're getting prideful. You're getting cocky. You're forgetting that God has sustained you. And then, you know, you start talking to people and you know, F word slides here. You start cussing here. Because you're not being filled with the Spirit. Why is it so easy to be on fire for God when we first repent, when we first come back and reconcile? But then months later, we're like, oh, I just don't feel like I'm on fire anymore. That's the answer. You're not on fire because you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. That's it. Case closed. We can, we can, I can end this podcast right now. Case closed. Everybody go home. Is your answer. You're not filled. That's why you're not on fire anymore. Well, then get on fire. Get on fire for God. That's what next generation faith is all about. I want people to be on fire for God. I want them to have a faith that is next level. Right? Everyone's talking about revival right now. That's why I'm talking about how important the Holy Spirit is. You, 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 revival is about bringing the love of God back to this earth, putting people on fire, that God becomes, uh, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, God becomes cool again. Why is he cool? Because people are seeing the repentance on a widespread scale. People are seeing what God is doing at a huge level. And so that can't happen if you have a bunch of mediocre Christians who come once in a while, spend more time watching football than they do praying, uh, spend more money watching entertainment and traveling than they do in their own church. They spend more time talking about nonsense at their job than they do talking about God. And and then you expect, you know, for people to be on fire for God. Why would they be on fire? You, you're you not on fire. You don't even look appealing to be on fire. Like, if you told me to be on fire, I'd look at you and say, that's, I don't want to live like you. Like, people need to look at you and say, I want what you have. I want that. What is that? And then you say, oh, that's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He lives in me. When I repented, he put a spirit in me. And now I have a supernatural ability to live differently. I have a way to live differently. And every day I go and I pray and I read and I meditate and I ask the Holy Spirit to fill me so I have the power to live each day according to his words and principles for this earth, according to the purpose he's given me. Then they're looking at you like, whoa, how do I get that? And then you can minister to them the reconciliation. Well, they get that. You need to repent because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us is good. All of us are evil. Yet God in his mercy saw the state of mankind, the, you know, how the flesh would not submit. And then... He sent his son to die for us. And in him, we have repentance if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth. And then we, if we love him, according to Jesus, if we love Jesus, then we obey. Do you obey? Do you pray for the sick and do you anoint them with oil? Do you go out and give to the widow, to the orphan? Do you minister to the town? Do you have the signs and the wonders that follow you, the evidence that go around you? No. Because you're not on fire. So let's get on fire. Let's get filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. That's what we're doing. When we live for God, when we live for God, and when we go and have that fire, that spirit that fills us, when we do that, that's how we change the world. That's how we have revival. That's how we bring people back to church. That's how we bring repentance. That's how we bring people to fall in love with God once again. So, we as Christians, and if you're not a Christian, it's time to repent. We need to come back to God and ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's what's going to give us peace. That's what's going to give us the patience, the gentleness. It's what's going to change us to not believe according to the principles of this world, right? In this world, everything's cutthroat, ambitious. You got to go and get it, chase the bag, get that money. You're a queen. 
you're amazing, everyone else is wrong, you're better than everyone. That's the world telling you to live that way. But in Christ, it's patience, long-suffering, gentleness. Think of yourself, think of others more highly than yourself. Um, living humbly, right? Living uh, without reproach, always treating other people not well, or treating them well and giving them no reason to speak ill about you. Being a good representative on earth, you know, not being a drunkard, not being addicted to wine or drinking or drugs, right? Being a father who's there for their children. So that's only possible if you have the Holy Spirit. Now, if there's people who do it in the world, but why do they do it? They do it for vain reasons, maybe because they believe in their heart that this is how human beings should be, maybe because they're upset they didn't have a father, or they're going to, in spite of the way the world treats, they're going to act away. As a Christian, we do that because the Holy Spirit gives us supernatural power to do that in spite of. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can only do these things for so long. Eventually, you get tired of it, and you break, and you snap. Because you just can't pretend to be a good being when you're not a good being. Human beings are not good. That's that's the problem. At the end of this, human beings are not good. We're not good. We are full of sin and evil, and we want to do evil. Our flesh wants to sin, and it's corrupted. There's, we're just not good. This idea that we're good and some of us shouldn't have suffered, that's not true. Every human being is evil. We're born innate with it. Jesus heals us and and restores us back into righteousness and gives us a power to be good. Um, but we're not good of our own accord. It's by faith in Jesus that we have the supernatural power through the Holy Spirit to be good. We need, we really need the Holy Spirit. Um, it's it, you, you can't believe in a supernatural God and think that you're not going to have a supernatural um, re- reaction, response. You can't believe that God says that he made you the temple for his Holy Spirit. You can't think that you're just, that's like a metaphorical, that's a metaphor, that's a metaphorical thing because his Holy Spirit was poured out on Jesus and his disciples. So, it wasn't metaphorical. There was a real inhabitation of the Holy Spirit, and it guided them and made them live a different way. So, uh, you know, hopefully next week, um, you know, some people reach out. Maybe I'll have some testimonies or I'll reach it to a couple, uh, you know, listeners and, and friends who have really chimed in on what their Holy Spirit experiences, and I'll have either a list or some feedback, or maybe I'll get some calls. But um, I, if you're listening to this, and as a bonus episode, I really want you to receive the idea that the Holy Spirit is so necessary, you know, to live on fire for God, especially in this time when all the evidence is that God isn't real. And it's so easy to walk away from the church. Um, they're walking away because they're not on fire. They're walking away because they don't feel connected to God. And they're looking for that experience. That's why every so many people are going to drugs, alcohol, you know, new age religion, because they're looking for something supernatural. They know that something's missing. And the church just really isn't doing its job if it's not preaching or being led by the Holy Spirit in its worship and preaching. We need to be more submitted to what God is trying to do on this earth. There are things he's trying to do, people he's trying to reach. There's a mission he's trying to accomplish. So please uh, submit to the Holy Spirit. If you're not a Christian, uh, get in contact with your local church and begin to ask these hard questions. I'm not saying you have to believe today, but ask those questions and see if you get the answers you're looking for, because I promise you God is going to give you those answers. God is going to meet you where you're at, And he's going to make it clear to you that he's real and he's always been in your life. He's going to make it clear that he's had your back. He's going to make it clear that you need him. And he's going to show you with evidence what he has for you. Because he's designed you with a purpose. And his plan for you is so much greater than what you could even imagine. According to the way this world works, no. He's giving you a divine plan. A plan that's going to uh, bring you to a place of completion where your life is going to be so much more fulfilling than it ever has been. So if you've really enjoyed this podcast bonus episode... Please like, share, subscribe, um, you know, share it with your friends. It'd mean the world to me. I really want to hear and create it. I want to hear f- feedback from people, and I want to create a, a really strong spiritual community where we can, you know, benefit and bless other people and talk about these topics that sometimes aren't always discussed in the way that, you know, we want to discuss them. We want to discuss things, you know, sometimes so politically correct. You know, we can kind of get into the nitty gritty of what it means to really be a Christian, and we can kind of be straight up. So thank you so much for your time and um, on to the next one. All right. Thanks for tuning into FaithCast. I hope our conversation today has fueled your spiritual fire, strengthened your faith and driven you towards your unique purpose in God. Remember, your faith is not just a belief, but a purpose-driven journey that can change the world if you let it. 
If you have any questions, comments, or insights, do not hesitate to share or reach out to me. I'm always here for you, and I'm honored that you'd consider me to be part of your journey. Until next time, keep that fire of your faith burning bright, and keep moving forward on your path.